Welcome to Shovelware Diggers. Our dig team is currently excavating the SoftKey Shareware 2000 Hit Games 2 CD Collection. You can find a link in the video description containing the entire directory structure of this archive. It's week 26, and this is what we've got lined up for today. For more information on how to join the dig team, simply head on over to the Patreon page linked in the video description. Now without further ado, let's begin. First up, we have a triple person team dig. We've got Anton Panetta, Martin Hirschberg, and Yarmo Ronta all digging up DOS games backslash new DOS backslash demon orb. So it's gotta be good, right? So a little bit of a confession here. I already attempted to record this segment and had my microphone on mute because I don't know. <laughs> But in any case, so I've already played through this game and know what to expect. So my reactions aren't going to be like first reactions to this because there were some odd things that happened. And let me start by showing you the directory structure here. You'd think looking at all these different executables. Well, first of all, brun45 is there. So that's a dead giveaway that this was made using Quick Basic. But one of the things I tried to do was to run game. But what ended up happening is I completely crashed DOSBox just now. <laughs> that didn't happen the first time. Um, okay. Interesting. Well, let me see if I can actually get this game working properly. Okay, so what ended up happening the first time I tried to run this is I ran game, and it gave me a number at the top, and a device unavailable error, which was very weird. And I couldn't figure out what was going on, so I eventually ran, I eventually read the daemon.doc file that was there, and it turns out that this game only works properly when it's run from a prompt. So what we're going to do to make this game work is mount a drive as my actual DOS files folder with the 2000, with the 2000 game shareware CD, because I actually have the CD completely, completely on the hard drive so I don't have to mount it or anything. And then we're going to go DOS games, new DOS, demon orb. And now, when we run this from a prompt using the demon.bat file, which I don't think we have to, but there we go. The game is finally working. Nebula Systems presents Demon Orb 1 The Quest for the Orb, produced using Microsoft Quick Basic. And the guy's name is Andrew Sega, which I have to wonder if that was his actual name or not, but anyways. And I, this is also weird. The shower notice here, you have to put sh push shift C in order to continue. And here's the weird thing is that it says the software may be copied freely as long as the notice is not removed and the software is not altered. But wouldn't that technically make it freeware if you're not charging money for it? I don't know. Anywho. Start a new character, and character generator, your name, my name is me. Space to roll. Let's get some decent stats here. And in fact, now that I know what's involved, I actually have a better idea of what decent is for this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at all the 18s. Now, I should point out that even though it looks like it's doing D&D style um, number limits, these numbers actually go up when you level up. So... 18 is the natural limit, but these will increase as we play. So, and then we just run our character, and here we go. So it's basically, it's a 3D sort of game, similar in vain to other Dungeons & Dragons 3D games. Because there were a bunch of them that came out, and they usually presented you with a 3D view, and then had a sort of battle system that happened. And we're already under attack by vampire bats. I'll fight those. Attack monster one. Attack monster one again. And attack monster two. And there we go. Now, one of the things I learned when, on my first playthrough of this, you want to save after every single battle. Because this game is horribly unbalanced. We're about to fight three stalag monsters. They're not too bad, except I'm probably going to get killed. Because <laughs> there's three of them. And so we'll load our save game. And then we're back to it. 
And now we got a minor demon. This thing is impossible. He has 66 hit points and can hit for, like, a lot. And you can face these, like, right at the very start of the dungeon. Like, your very first battle after just taking, like, two steps. Or not even taking a step, because all you have to do is, like, if I hit save... Okay, it saved my game. Let's save. Save again. Notice at the side that my hit points are going up? It's because saving takes up a movement turn. <laughs> Even turning around takes up a movement turn. Anywho, we got a skeleton here. Yay, beat the skeleton. And I believe that's a level up. I actually found a longsword. <laughs> I went through 20 minutes of gameplay to demonstrate this, and I didn't find a single weapon beyond daggers. So yes, that will take that longsword. And I leveled up. And as you can see, all of my stats now are one point higher. So those 18s are now all 19s, and then they'll eventually go up to 20 and 21, and yeah. So saved in character. Two ogres, I am very dead. And that's how it is with this game, is that you basically got to keep reloading, because I just reloaded, didn't get to move, and I'm already have to face a stone giant. And I'm dead again. And that's basically how this game plays, is you base, is you, whoops, is you've got this 3D maze to go through, but there's no balancing in the, in the random combat. So you end up fighting either weak enemies or ridiculously strong enemies. But now I should point out, though, that this game very much plays like somebody's f sort of first attempt at doing a sort of game like this. This very much has the feel of, a, of like, just a side project for someone who's still learning how to program. And you can try to run from battle, but you seriously... The, the rate of run... And I just got into another fight just from running anyways. But the rate of being able to run from enemies is just abysmal. A sword of magic. Plus zero. <laughs> and see, here's another way you can tell it's sort of been done by somebody still learning to program. is In QBasic, one of the things that happens when you try to render a number using a string is that it reserves a spot for the negative sign. So when it so you see how there's a the sword of magic and then there's no space and then a plus symbol but then there's a space and a zero. And that's because the guy's trying to render the number immediately after the plus symbol but it's still reserving a space to put the negative sign in if it needs it. Now there's tricks you can do to get around this. And I, the most common trick is to just use the L trim command, which trims off all spaces on the left side of a string. But you have to do that on a string, and numbers are integers, not strings. So you have to first convert that string, that integer string, into... You have to convert the integer into a string format. And that's done with the str dollar sign command. So it's L trim dollar sign, S string str dollar sign and your number that you want to get to not have that negative sign res reservation space in if that makes any sense I'm, I'm sure that makes sense to the programmers amongst you but everybody else probably like completely <laughs> oh, well, i'm already a champion apparently <laughs> and i barely i haven't even been playing that long really see so, yeah, i really don't have too much more to say about this game Demon's Orb is clearly a game made by somebody still learning how to program. It just has that feel about it, that it was something that they were just sort of putting together in their spare time, trying to learn how to do all the programming of games and such, just because of the fact that there's major balancing issues, and that the game is ultimately incredibly simple in terms of how it's played. The game's not terrible, but it's not great. This is not something you sit down specifically to enjoy. This is something you sit down to play just to sort of see how it begins for somebody like this who's learning the ropes of how to make these games and such. It's a curiosity, and that's probably the best way to put it. Next up, Pixel Diva dug up DOS games backslash adventure backslash ADV maze. I got a funny feeling we got a maze game here. So... 
Huh? Single executable? Let's see. Mission Control welcomes you to Maze Mission Adventure Game. Program designed by William Slow. We got another one of Slow's old games here. I think I've actually played this before. Stand by for important telecommunication. Sent on a top secret assignment to discover where three essential objects stolen from Mission Control have been sequestered. Missing items are the electromagnet, the solar lamp, and the XR7 power drill. Your first objective is to find the electromagnet. It is located somewhere on this level. It will look like this. Which is a fairly basic symbol. Level 1. So, I don't remember exactly how to play this. How do we use our... How do we get anywhere? Okay, spacebar. Map enlarger? Oh, that's handy. But it doesn't stay that way. That's kind of dumb, then. You've caused a cave-in? Um, seriously? Well, come on. I should point out that Solo's early games usually have issues with them. It's only his later stuff that is much more better balanced. Oh, we got some enemies, I guess. Huh? What just happened? Okay, so the ray gun only works... The ray gun basically works if there's enemies on the screen. You don't have to be, like, in their line of sight or anything. In fact, being in their line of sight is what kills you. Okay, that's the item I'm looking for. Question is, can we get there without completely burning through all of our bombs? We got it. You have succeeded in finding the electromagnet. The second objective is to find the solar lamp. It will look like this. Uh, wait, so now where do I go? Oh, I'm out of TNT. Oh, that's not good. Because <laughs> now I can't do anything except teleport. It actually put me on a side of wall there. You'd think that would kill most people. So yeah, one of Solo's one of William Solo's early games, it's not particularly great, but it kind of has those inklings of some of his later titles. So it's like he had an idea and was sort of fleshing it out at this point. It's got some good polish to it for a text mode game, so it's not that the game's unplayable, it's just a little bit on the unfair side. But it's worth giving a play at least once, just to sort of check out sort of how he was getting his start with software like this. And our last game for today is DOS Games Backslash Arcade Backslash Fighters, which was dug up by Scott Percival. I'm gonna guess some kind of fighting game, just because it's called Fighters. Although all we have is a dock and an executable. Hmm. Be sure to turn NumLock on. NumLock is on. <laughs> uh, huh. So, those are some bizarre keys. Um, Z, C, and X. Okay. B is miss. Kind of weird, but I can, I can get used to this. So... Okay, press any key to play. Oh, it's one of these things. <laughs> okay, so... Apparently today we're just seeing a lot of um, people's firsts. <laughs> That's probably what I'm going to title the episode, the, this um, video for, is just the fact that we're seeing a lot of people's like initial projects here. And this is another one of those projects that's... One of the things you'd like to do when you're an early co game coder is you kind of like to put together automated things or things that are just very basic but let you sort of experiment with stats and such. So there is a laser weapon but you can barely see it come up on screen. 
Yeah, that's a thicker laser. Quad lasers. Some kind of attack like that. But yeah, the idea is you're basically just... Because this is definitely a two-player only thing. So I can move both players here. And it's basically just... You're just trying to do damage. So there's literally no strategy here. You would just... As, as a person actually playing this, you would just choose... It comes down to dominant strategy. You would choose the best weapon and just hammer away at the opponent with it. But apparently that's not it because the player's got shields going. So I'd have to use, like, the lasers here to get the shields down. And then I could switch to this weapon, which apparently still didn't do much. What about the missiles? I need to do a little more. And then you just shoot and destroy the opponent. Now, with two people on the keyboard at the same time, this would probably be kind of a mess. And it kind of still is, just from the fireworks. <laughs> but, um... This is basically just something somebody would make, somebody made, because they just want to see, like, how the numbers sort of play out. And they're not trying to make a game that you're trying to enjoy, even though that's what they th might think they're trying to do, but they're trying to make a game that just is sort of an experiment. Because I've actually made stuff like this myself, so <laughs> I know what I'm talking about when it comes to these kinds of games. You make this stuff because it's interesting to you, because it lets you experiment with the numbers and with how things are working without actually technically making a game. <laughs> because, let's face it, you anybody who's made stuff like this will probably agree with me here. When you actually do make something like this and you try to get somebody else to play it with you, you play it for like five minutes tops. <laughs> Because it's not that interesting. You're just going to choose the best weapon and just hammer it on your opponent. So it basically comes down to who can hit this, who can hit their fire key the fastest. So it really is more about just experimentation than actually making a fun game. So to that extent, like this is kind of, this is interesting, but this is not something you would sit down and play. And that's, that kind of explains a lot of early projects, not the, um, not the one from William Slow just a short while ago because that was actually released as shareware and everything and actually had some polish to it, but it was still one of his earlier projects. One of his earlier commercial projects, in a sense. So, yeah, that's basically what it comes down to with stuff like this. It's, it's mostly for, for sake of experimentation and learning and not in terms of actually trying to make something people want to purchase. So... In any case, it does what it set out to do, and it probably helped the person learn more about coding. <laughs>